Welcome to episode 48 of the Known Pleasures podcast. Today we have another interview episode for you. It's one that all three of us are really excited about, although I won't be partaking. I'm kind of working behind the scenes today. In this episode, we will be talking to the former lead singer and songwriter of the seminal UK punk band, The Stranglers, Hugh Cornwell. On the eve of his upcoming Australian tour, we will be asking him about the new album, his days with The Stranglers, and everything in between. So get a grip on yourself and listen in to a few moments of madness from the mind of Hugh Cornwell. And just as a side note, Hugh Cornwell's camera wasn't working, so we've replaced him with some wonderful photos and videos. Thanks so much for joining us. You've got a hectic schedule in the next few months. You've got gigs in, what, the Netherlands, uh, the UK, and then you're coming out to New Zealand and Australia in July and August. That's it. Yeah, that's it. We're very excited about that. Um, can I start by asking you about... Uh, the Moments of Madness album, the lyrics um, on the album in, in particular, is it difficult to get the balance right between being a cynical old codger, to uh, quote the uh, Strangler song, um, and uh, trying to sort of be connected with with the world? I mean, the, some, some of the lyrics like, I uh, don't want to be a young man, there's no attraction I can see. Um, are you are you inhabiting a character there? In- it's just me. I'm 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 a, my years are advancing, and I'm not a young man anymore. So it's a, it's me facing facts and face being truthful. You know, it's it's not it's not conjuring up some character that, that I'm I'm not an I'm not an actor. You know, that's what actors do. Uh, act- actors can't stand to be themselves. They they feel terrible when they're not playing a role. So they 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 don't know who they are. You know, which is a very sad state of affairs to be in. Well, most of them are. Um, so um, no, I, I just uh, moments of madness was is really coming clean about a lot of things. You know, and um, and that's one of them. You know, admitting admitting that that you're getting older and you're losing your faculties. But luckily, the faculties of making music haven't left me yet. And, um, and really, you look back at, at youth now and you think, well, there's, there's not a lot to be, uh, that I can, uh, you know, be jealous of there. You know, I'd rather, I'd rather be where, I think I'd rather be where I am. Thank you. <laughs> well, I think, um, uh, and, uh, another lyric said, see what the world is coming to. Couldn't make it up if you wanted to. Then again, this could be a nightmare. Better kick me in the derriere, um, which is a fantastic rhyme, by the way. Um, uh, so yeah, yeah, I think um, I, I, I think your your feelings about the world are coming through loud and clear. Good, yeah, yeah. And my, I mean, that song I want to hide inside it. It's a it, it's getting back to a primeval thing that that uh, and and I'm 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 brought back to something that I heard when I was 15 years old in school. A kid in out at one of the classrooms got up before the teacher came in and said, "Listen, guys, I've come to a conclusion." He said, um, "He said, uh, ma- man spends his first eight months of his life trying to get out of a woman, and then spends the rest of his life trying to get back in." And I, I never, I, I never forgot that. And this is a fifteen-year-old kid that came up with that, which I thought was incredible. So, I mean, you know, it's a primeval thing. You know, and that that line you that you that verse you just quoted from that song is just su- sums it all up, really. I mean, you know, I just want to go off and hide and be safe and sound somewhere. It's extraordinary that something you heard at, at school um, comes into a, a song title several decades later. That song, you know, you, you never know where the uh, creativity is going to come from. No, it, yeah, I mean, it just made sense to make it all one word. You know, I, I told my Matt. Yeah, I told yeah, my manager that. what the title was, and he said, "So it's I that N want to." And I went, "No, no, it's all one word. I want to hide inside you. It's just one word, you know. It that's how it makes sense to me." Um, Hugh, um, thanks for joining us. Really, uh, great to speak to you. I've been a long time admirer of your works. Um, according to your uh, your autobiography, "Multitude of Sins," you said you discovered music at a very early age. I just want to talk a bit about that. Going back to school days. Uh, what did you want to be when you grew up? Did you really want to be a singer, just like Cliff Richard? That is a true story. You know, I, d- I didn't want to be an engine driver, and I didn't want to be a doctor, and I didn't want to be anything else I could think of. And 
that was the only thing that that uh, that had fired my imagination you know so so i said it and got obviously got in a lot of hot water when i got home that night uh, from my parents so what are you no we just had a call from the school saying that you said you know <laughs> and i said well i'm just trying to be honest you know and they were you can't say things like that well who's laughing now eh <laughs> Well, that that became and that caused confusion in my head. So I thought, well, I, I was always told you got to be, you got to speak the truth. So I spoke the truth, and now I'm getting into trouble for it, you know. But that isn't that life, you know. Isn't that the story of life? Indeed, it is. Um, I, uh, with that sort of given that you left the Stranglers, you know, in 1990 after your final gig with them, and you released over 10 solo albums, I think. Um, when you come and uh, do these gigs around the world playing, you know, some of the old songs and obviously some of the new ones as well and talking about those days with, with people like us, um, does it feel like you're recalling a completely different life, like a whole other person that you almost don't recognise now? Yeah, I mean, it feels like I'm doing colour versions, you know, when I play the Stranger <laughs> songs. It's, re- it's really odd. I mean, I don't mean that in any disrespectful way to the mu- to the songs because I love them. You know, I mean, I, I, I wrote or co-wrote all of them so uh I, I love you know i love the i love the songs and they're part of me and part of my character and i can't imagine going on stage and playing a whole set of uh, without playing without touching a strangler song it would be really odd uh and it wouldn't feel right uh, and that's that's just how i feel truthfully you know so it's not made up um so uh so I don't know if that answers your your question. Yeah, it does. It does. It's interesting seeing the 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 evolution of the the, the, the creative side of the Stranglers and yourself. Uh, I I recently read your Arnold Drive novel and really enjoyed it. Um, and uh, the affection and almost almost reverence you have for the vicar, the main character in in that novel, is is slightly in contrast to the fairly jokey bell clip for Duchess, which um with the um the the uh, choristers uh, oh the the video the video in the church yeah yeah, 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 which yeah, is, yeah. Which, and and I and I like them both equally the Duchess film clip and the the, the Arnold Arnold Drive novel. But yeah just just the uh, evolution of your your uh actually your attitude to, to 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 the church or to the establishment. I'm not sure the uh, connection between those two. Well, I'm not sure either. <laughs> I mean, at the time, the video made sense, and um, when we were making the video, and then, uh, and then when I was riding Arnold Drive, that made sense too. You know, so um, I, 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 I don't know what the answer to that is. Do you um, recall fondly coming to Australia? I think it was in '79 for the first time. Uh, with the band, I know you were the first, you know, punk band or so-called punk band to come to Australia, and it was sort of a, a bit controversial, as I recall it. I think we couldn't go to New Zealand. Is that right? I think we came to Australia. We went to Australia, and we wanted to go to New Zealand, but they 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 read all the stories about us and believed them all, and 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 were scared of letting us in, so they wouldn't let us in. I think that's what happened the first time we came down there. Yeah, it was a, it was it was a great trip. Um, I remember that uh, before coming to Australia, we'd been to Japan for the first time, and you know when when the when we got the news that we were going to to Japan, and then then we we're going to Australia straight afterwards. Everyone was really excited about going to Japan, but I was more excited about coming to Australia because uh, it's somewhere that that I sort of had a I could relate to. I mean, you can't really relate as a Westerner to Japan. I mean, it's just, it's just a complete foreign culture you know it's it's mm. alien it's totally alien they it's like they've stood they do everything uh, it seems like when you first go there that it's a completely alien culture but in fact the uk and japan have got a lot of things in common um i've i've, I've realized um you know they're an island off a large uh, land mass with a strange weather uh, unpredictable weather they 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 they're riddled by traditional values which other people think are very quaint uh, they're both the same you know um uh, in that respect so they've got a lot a lot of similarities but at the time i i was so excited about going to australia it was it was funny you got a great song out of it too you got a nuclear device out of the queensland trip so it wasn't a total waste 
Um, there, there was a venue in what do you remember the venue we played in Brisbane that was it was a tavern and a large tavern, the Exchange Tavern, I think it was called. From I'm yeah, and, and it got it got closed down afterwards by Peterson's uh, boys. You know, they mm. they they managed to close it down because they came in and started a riot when we were playing in there. So, so obviously, it got got its license revoked. But it it, it wouldn't have if they hadn't have um, you know provoked it. Um, in the first place, so uh, there you go. Anyway, that that's that's your business, the, the internal politics of Australia. Uh, it was yeah, it was fun, and um, I love Perth as well. I've got great. I know you, all, you, the rest of you in the country, look at Perth as being. Are they really part of Australia? From a foreigner's <laughs> point of view, it's it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful place to visit. You know, that it's it's part and past. The whole place is a complete um, Pandora's box, you know, Australia. And uh, on one hand, you can wake up one day and you'll be in Perth and you can wake up the next day and you're in Sydney and they're completely different, uh, you know, different places and attitudes and everything. So it's it's wonderful. Well, we love having yeah, it's you. It's great. So <laughs> keep coming back. <laughs> you were more or less banned, weren't you, from, from the Australian music show Countdown? Was that, was, was that the story? Countdown. I don't know. I can't remember. Uh, is that right? Uh, the host of the show, uh, Ian Ian Meldrum, um, yeah, um, certainly came up with a fairly vitriolic anti stranglers statement. I recall. Well, the, well, guy, guys, you know that what we what you're talking about is so long ago. I mean, yeah, yeah, I've yeah. been out. I've been out of the stranglers twice as long as I was in there. So you know, <laughs> that's right. To, yeah. to yeah. me, to me, it's a distant. Fleck, a uh, blurred image on the horizon from where I am now. So, uh, so I, I, I can't really offer much. I, I think you probably know more about what happened then than I do. You know, uh, but I do remember going for the coming to Australia for the first time. You know, that was nice, and um, and I remember coming back five years ago, the last time I came with uh, mm. with Windsor and Pat, the same lineup, and uh, this time we'll have the. We'll be able to play some songs from um, Moments of Madness as well, which is which is going to be good. So it's a full band you're bringing. Oh yes, 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 yes. When they say it's a solo tour, that can be a bit misleading because he, a lot of people think, oh, solo. That means he's going to stand there with an acoustic guitar and do a sort of a Bob Dylan thing. But no, a solo tour is really um, misleading people. It's 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 a it's a, it's a tour of me with a band. You know, it's, it's mm. uh, and. Under my name, so uh, could, it'd probably be better if it said the Hugh Cornwell Band. Mm. That that would be less misleading, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> did you always feel that you'd go solo? I mean, you know, go, going back in time, did you always think one day, look, I, I want to do my own stuff? I, I can't sort of see myself. No, like- not at no, not at all, not at all. I was very at home. I was very at home in uh, in the Stranglers' ethic and the way it was. Um, the way it was, uh, the way it behaved, you know, I was very at home in that for for a long time. You know, I felt it was my band. I, I started it, so. Mm. Uh, uh, but then I got, uh, I got, I got uh, bored with it, you know, and uh, thought I could. Um, I thought I'd have more fun. I think it's down to having fun. You know, it wasn't any fun anymore. So uh, I thought I could have more fun if I if I if I wasn't in the band. You've compared being in a band to a relationship, like a marriage. Do you find that the situation you're in now a lot easier? Where I guess you're changing partners. Is that <laughs> a good way of putting it? Oh, not at not at all. It's it's you see because because it's my it's my show, and you know so, so there's no politics anymore. You know the one thing I do, I don't miss about being in a band is the bloody politics involved. There's no nobody's. You don't have to keep anyone sweet, or nobody has to keep me sweet. It's just, it's, it's, it's just uh, uh, Pat and Windsor. They play for me, you know, and they know it, and and they 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 love doing it, and they they always ask me if I'm happy, you know, with what they're doing, which is great. And there's no arguments, you know. It's just uh, there's no, I won't say argument, difference of opinion. There's no differences of opinion. You know, we're we're all pulling in the same direction. They love the songs that I that I write, and and they want them to to be played, and 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 admired and and liked by the audiences, so that they they do their very best, and and they're very good at it. You know, and um, 
they bring a lot of energy to it that um, that has been lacking uh, in the sense that uh, they're they're a, they're a generation younger than me. You know, they're 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 young enough to be my kids, and um, and sometimes I do feel like their dad. You know, and I <laughs> and I get uh, and I get to know what they're up to. You know, I I I found um, uh, the end of the time when I was with the band that. Uh, I didn't really know what anyone's life was, what was happening in anyone's life anymore. You know, we were just meeting up like going to an office, uh, you know, and, uh, and then after the uh, hours, uh, five o'clock, you know, we all went home to our different lives and I didn't really know what was going on with, with, with in their lives. And, um, and I make a point of, you know, of, of, of asking Pat and Windsor about their lives, you know, and what they're up to and stuff. And, um, and they asked me about me too. So, uh, and we we share we share we share um, information, you know, in both directions, and it's uh, it's lovely. There's no politics. You had three novels published. Um, the process of of writing a novel compared to writing a song, apart from the fact that it, that it takes a lot longer, is it is it a different kind of mindset? Do you think? Well, listen, the only thing they've got in common is that they've both got beginnings and ends. And that's about the only thing that is that is there is in common between writing a novel and writing a song. It's it's I had I was shocked at how different a process it is. It, it's it's quite mind boggling. I mean, you're while well, you're uh, writing a novel takes a lot longer than writing a song. Well, it's most cases. <laughs> Uh, some people take longer to write songs than others. I mean, I, I remember the longest time I spent writing a song was about six months I spent on a song called Black Hair, Black Eyes, Black Suit. I kept taking it back and re rewriting it. And finally, it took six months. And I thought that was a long time, you know. Uh, and But with books, you're talking about years. And, um, and you've got to c- constantly remember what happened at the beginning because uh, because what happens in the middle has got to make sense with what happened at the beginning, whereas a song it doesn't that doesn't necessarily follow. Um, so you know there, there's all sorts of differences between the two. It's fascinating discovering the difference. In fact, um, Hugh, I just wanted to sort of say I've gone back and listened to a lot of a lot of your stuff, including right back to Nosferatu, your first solo album, um, and, and your voice. Um, it's so evocative for me. It takes me back to my, you know, teenage years and all that sort of thing. It's great to hear you singing again and singing well. Do you think you've really developed as a musician and, and a singer? You know, obviously you've developed, but do you think you've made leaps and bounds in those areas from, from back then to now? I don't think I've got as much range now singing-wise because I can't get up to some really high notes. Uh, and um, and Windsor helps me out sometimes uh, live. We, uh, we both sing he sings a high octave of what I'm doing um, sometimes. Uh, that helps. Um, but, uh, you know, they, the, the Nosferatu stuff is, uh, is very different from anything else I've done. And, um, and in fact, we'll be, we'll be touching some of, of the Nosferatu when we, uh, when we come over. We, they, they, love, uh, they, love le- they love learning the stuff from Nosferatu, they say, because it's so complicated, so bloody complicated. <laughs> oh, we love it. Great. We love it. And they write their charts out. You know, they listen to it and write their charts out. And then we try and rehearse it. And they go, my God, you know, Jesus Christ. <laughs> and, um, and, but, uh, but some of them are going to get an airing. You know, I mean, uh, Big Bug goes down. They love playing Big Bug. We Mothra. Are like you going to play Mothra? Big Bug. Mothra. <laughs> we play Mothra. Yeah, they, oh. they love playing Mothra too. So, uh, right. <laughs> so yeah, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be getting those out and giving them a dusting over as well, yeah. And uh, uh, I gather that you're a bit of a cricket fanatic. I have been known to enjoy a game of cricket, yes. Didn't you do uh, a spot of cricket commentary? Well, <laughs> I've been, on the, I've been on the, in the commentary box in Sydney with uh, Jim Maxwell. Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure if I actually. Do, I don't think he let me loose on the microphone <laughs> right. uh, to to do any commentary. But um, but I've been in the commentary box. You know, both in the UK and in Australia. I, lo- I love it. It's great. Great view of the game. Wow. But I did. Uh, one of my great claims to fame is that I I watched the Test match where Ricky Ponting got twin hundreds. You know, and I think it was in his hundredth Test. Am I right in thinking that? Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, it was against South Africa, I think. And uh, I, I saw that match. Yeah, it's great. It's the Sydney Test. And I had a gig. I remember I had a gig that night uh, after he, on the fifth day. I had a gig that night in Sydney. So was it a uh, st- strategic misstep on your part to have your Australian and New Zealand tour happening in the winter here? Yeah, it didn't really work very well, did it? Um, but um, but hey, your summers are still better than our. Uh, your winters are still better better weather than our summers. So. I'm bringing uh, I'm bringing shorts and t-shirts, you know, and not many pairs of socks. <laughs> well, that wouldn't work in some parts of, of yeah. uh, Australia. So, so, so definitely check the uh, long long range forecast. Yes, exactly, exactly. Uh, well, I think that that just about r- yeah. wraps it up for for, for us. Here. If I can end at at the beginning, some, something that, that that has always in, intrigued me about the name uh, Guildford Stranglers, which I think the, a name you took on board in, what, 1974? And it was all, it was like a couple of years before punk, and it was it was the, well, well before punk hit the UK. And it was it was a very punk name. And, uh, yeah, I'm just t- just kind of curious about about how you managed to kind of conjure that up. Yeah, I think that John kept bringing it up. Uh, we we do a sh- we do a gig and it went disastrously wrong, you know, and everyone hated us. Yeah. And uh, John John would say, "Oh, the Stranglers have done it again." And so it was a sort of a pet word that he had, yeah, and yeah. Uh, we we ended up uh, adopting it, you know. Um, uh, it and uh, the name of the band that I'd brought over from Sweden, which which sort of metamorphosed into the Stranglers, was Johnny Socks. That that name didn't really didn't really <laughs> fit with what we were doing. You know, the lineup had changed and the personalities of the people were different. And so that name didn't fit. So so it, it seemed to work better, you know. Well, it ser- served you well. Um, I just want to say thanks for your time, Hugh. It's been a real uh, pleasure to speak to you. Right. I, I was in a very young band. I used to do a couple of Stranglers covers when we were 16 or 17, English Towns, and Everybody Loves You When You're Dead. So to speak to you is a great oh, you personal did, you highlight. Did, yes. You did. You, you covered those songs. Wow. We did, yeah. I had to learn your guitar parts. It wasn't too hard, but it took me a little while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, yeah the, the accent is not too hard because uh, I've never really considered myself a, a, a bona fide guitarist. You know, I've... I, I only started playing guitar. I started off as a bass player, actually, and uh, oh, okay. only started really trying to play guitar to um, to accompany my voice. You know, it's, I, I'm a singer, really. I mean, I always have mm. been a singer, singer writer, and uh, and the, the guitar playing has always been a side issue for me. And 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 I've never really invested enough time in in playing guitar. I, I do the minimum. <laughs> it's effective, though. It's very effective. I, I've always enjoyed what you do anyway, so, uh, yeah, keep it up. We're well, looking forward you. to seeing you in Sydney. We'll, uh, we'll be along for one of those gigs. So we're, we're based in Sydney, so we'll come along and see you. Great. Yeah, 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 yeah. Make yourselves, make your presence known because we'll, uh, we'll, we'll have a jar, as they say, I think. Right? I would love that. That Sounds would be great. fantastic. Sounds Thanks, great. Hugh. Brilliant. Thank, thank you very much indeed for your time, gents. Thanks. Thousand